nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty for all who believe. God bless America. Concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst of them. kingdom of Jesus Christ. May such things be accomplished by our gathering and by our worship of thee this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Lord, Heavenly Father, I am so blessed and grateful to be back here among this, my church family, and I thank you. We ask for your blessing on all those who cannot be here. And we ask your blessing on those who fought and died so that we can be here. Please let us listen to the pastor's words. Let us receive them with an open heart and process them with all of our mind. Let us then go out and share. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful weather we've been blessed with. And thank you for these people who stand firm in their faith and in their convictions and in their sure hope of your Son, Jesus' return. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. This poem is in the form of prayer. Lord, please change me. Lord, please change Make me really true, always trusting, obeying, depending on you. Create in me a new heart. Write all your name. Give me a sparkle of your love and wisdom, and I never will be the same. In this imperfect world, in the time of death, Shine your light, light on my path, and I will do my best. Guide me step by step with the land of the world. Make me reflect your love. Bring hope to the needy world. I promise to be still and listen to your voice, Lord. Please change me so my soul will rejoice. Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. Jesus, speaking to the scribes and to the Pharisees, said, I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and he received me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe who receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed, believed me. For he, Moses, wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Amen. 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 Last week's sermon was entitled, The Four Witnesses. And we considered witnesses that spoke on Jesus' behalf and who could and would give testimony corroborating what Jesus was saying about himself. And what Jesus was saying about himself mainly at that time was that he had been sent by God the Father. And we actually only looked at three of the four witnesses. One of them was John the Baptist who testified concerning Jesus, this is the Son of God. And he came to such a conclusion because he actually saw 
the Spirit of God descend upon Jesus and remain upon Jesus exactly as God had earlier told John that it would happen. Jesus offered a second witness to testify on his behalf, and that was the record of his works, the miracles that Jesus had performed. His manifold and manifest miracles gave proof that Jesus is Messiah sent from God. But they did more than that. Through his miraculous works, and his preaching the good news, Jesus offered the poor and lost and desperate people something that they had very little of. He offered them hope. Jesus promised them salvation. And a third witness testifies on Jesus' behalf, and that witness is God the Father himself who on two of the three occasions wherein the voice of God thundered from heaven, Jesus, God said concerning Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this morning, let us consider the fourth witness. A fourth witness whose testimony verifies Jesus' assertion that he had been sent by God the Father, that he had been sent here to this earth among his people from God the Father. And that fourth witness is the Scriptures. Jesus says in John chapter 5 and verse 39, Search the Scriptures. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they, those scriptures, are those things which testify, Jesus says, they testify of me. Now in your King James Version of the Bible, it sounds like an imperative. Sounds like a command. Search the scriptures. In other English translations of the Bible, it sounds less like a command and more like a declarative statement. Jesus may have been saying, you search the scriptures and you study the scriptures because you think you will find eternal life in them. <coughs> Jesus reminded those, the scribes and the Pharisees, he reminded those who were so vehemently opposed to him that they wanted to kill him that they closely examined the Hebrew scriptures expecting to find eternal life in them. He reminded the scribes and the Pharisees that they put exhaustive research into every word of the ancient scriptures because they were sure that somewhere within those old tattered scrolls they would find the key to eternal life. And they were right. The scribes and the Pharisees were absolutely right about that. The key to eternal life was found in those old Hebrew scriptures. But they missed it. Jesus said, that all of those Hebrew scriptures spoke of him. Jesus said that their words, the words of the Hebrew scriptures, bore witness to him that, that their pages gave testimony to Jesus. He asserted that he was the key to eternal life within the pages of Hebrew scripture, that Jesus was the key to eternal life within the pages of Hebrew writ. But for all of their tedious examination, the scribes and the Pharisees missed it. The Hebrew scriptures are called the Tanakh. 
the Tanakh. That's what the Hebrew scriptures were called. We call it the Old Testament. They call it Tanakh. And with very few exceptions, the Tanakh and the Old Testament are the same. The books of the Tanakh are the same as the books of what we call the Old Testament, but they are organized in a different order. And there are 24 books in the Hebrew Tanakh, whereas in the Protestant Old Testament, there are 39 books. I gave you a sheet in your bulletin today that has our weekly questions on it, and then on the opposite side, on the back side, is a sheet that gives you a little chart about the Tanakh. And that sheet that has been provided for us in the insert of today's bulletin lists the books of the Hebrew Scriptures as they appear in the Tanakh. You will notice that Samuel in the Tanakh, Samuel is one book, while in the Old Testament, Samuel is divided into two books. We have 1st and 2nd Samuel. The same is true for the book of Kings and for the book of Chronicles. Furthermore, the Tanakh considers the 12 books of the minor prophets to be just one book, and they call it simply the 12. The Tanakh has one book for Ezra, while the Old Testament divides Ezra into two books. We call it Ezra and Nehemiah. The Tanakh, as you can see on your chart or up here on the screen, the Tanakh is organized into three sections. The first section is the Torah. The Hebrew word Torah meaning law. The Torah is also called the Pentateuch, and it consists of the first five books of the Bible. The books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah. The second section of the Tanakh is the Nevi'im, Nevi'im being the Hebrew word for prophets. And the Nevi'im consists in the writings of those whom the Hebrew scriptures considered to be prophets. And the third section of the Tanakh is called the Ketuvim. Ketuvim being the Hebrew word for writings. And the Ketuvim contains the writings of those who were not considered to be prophets, but whose words were considered to be inspired by God. And Jesus said, he told the scribes and the Pharisees of his day who doubted what he said, who doubted his origin, who doubted that he had come from God, Jesus said that the Tanakh, their Hebrew scriptures speak of him. Now today, there are two ways that we could examine, that we could investigate Jesus' claim, who said, the Tanakh, your Hebrew scriptures speak of me. <coughs> we could examine each of the 24 books of the Hebrew scripture and see if we can find Jesus in all 24 books of the Hebrew Scripture. And if you're prepared to listen to a 24-point sermon, I am prepared to offer it. But it might be a little more reasonable to take the three sections of the Tanakh, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and see if we can find Jesus 
in each of those three. The Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. So let's start with the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible. These books, these first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. And Jesus says that he is in the Torah. Jesus is in the Torah. Now the scribes and the Pharisees, they were experts in Old Testament law. They were experts in the Torah. They were devotees of Moses. They trusted in Moses, did the scribes and the Pharisees. Those who trusted in Moses, these scribes and Pharisees, did not receive Jesus, though. They did not believe in Jesus. But in John chapter 5 and verse 45, Jesus said that he, Jesus said that he would not personally accuse the scribes and the Pharisees to the Father for not believing in him. Jesus said that Moses would do that. That Moses would accuse them to the Father. Jesus said in verse 46 that if they had believed Moses, they would have believed in Jesus because Moses wrote about Jesus. Is it true? Did Moses actually write about Jesus? Well, let's see. Under the fiery inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, Moses recorded these words. They are words spoken by, the, spoken by God to the devil who used a serpent to deceive Eve. And these words are preserved for us by Moses in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 where Moses recorded this, what God said to the serpent, said to Satan through the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It, the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, O serpent, it, the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head, O Satan, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God promised way back in the Garden of Eden that one day, one day a woman would give birth to a man who would destroy the devil. A woman would give birth to someone who would bruise the head of the serpent, thereby destroying the devil. But in the process, the devil would injure that man, bruising his heel. And with those words, way back in the Garden of Eden, with those words, God promised a deliverer. With those words, God promised a Savior. He promised that someone would come and conquer sin, that someone would destroy the devil. And when Moses wrote those words, about whom was he writing? He was writing about Jesus. Later, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 14, Moses wrote about Abraham meeting a mysterious character named Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest and a king. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, it says in Genesis chapter 14. Salem being translated from the Hebrew as king of peace. This Melchizedek was king of peace. In fact, the name Melchizedek means 
king of righteousness. King of peace. King of righteousness is this Melchizedek whom Abraham met and about whom Moses wrote. Furthermore, though meticulous records of such things were kept at that time, there is no record of Melchizedek's birth. There is no record of Melchizedek's death. According to the official record of the time, he, Melchizedek, had neither beginning of days nor end of life. Huh. Now that is curious. In one person, he was king and priest. This Melchizedek was king of peace and king of righteousness. He had neither beginning nor an ending. Could it be that Melchizedek serves at least as a foreshadowing of someone else whom we consider king of peace, king of righteousness, someone else who had neither beginning of days nor ending of life, and who might that be? Jesus. Moses, in Genesis chapter 14, at least in shadows, was writing about Jesus. Furthermore, Moses made a record of Abraham's intended sacrifice of his beloved son, Isaac. It's recorded for us by Moses in Genesis chapter 22. While they made their way to the place of sacrifice, Isaac, not knowing that he was the intended sacrifice, noted, Father, we have fire, we have wood, but where, Father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham answered, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. And as you may recall, on that day, God did provide a suitable sacrifice in Isaac's stead. But for 2,000 years thereafter, the hope of Abraham resounded in the hearts of God's people. God will provide a lamb. Oh, people of Israel, oh, descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, those who long for one who is to come and deliver God's people, those, that one who will come and destroy the devil, putting an end to sin. Oh, Israel, God will provide a lamb. And then one day, one day old John the Baptist pointed out Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when Moses recorded those words, God will provide himself a lamb. Of whom did Moses speak? He wrote about Jesus. And those three instances, God's promise of a Savior way back in Eden, the account of Melchizedek and Abraham's confidence that God would provide a lamb. These three instances only get us halfway through the first book of the Bible. But may they serve as sufficient evidence 
of Jesus in the Torah. Jesus rightly told the scribes and the Pharisees, Moses wrote about me. But we see Jesus also in the prophets, in the Nevi'im. Jesus is in the prophets. Though we could find Jesus in every single one of the prophets, we will turn our attention to just one passage in the book of one prophet, that being the book of Isaiah and chapter 53. There, the words of the prophet tell of someone who is despised and rejected of men. Isaiah chapter 53 speaks of a man of sorrows, someone acquainted with grief. It says, we hid as it were our faces from him. Isaiah wrote about this someone. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted by God. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah would continue and say that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, we have turned to our own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of all of us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. After Isaiah wrote those words, for hundreds of years, God's people wondered of whom the prophet Isaiah was speaking. Was Isaiah talking about himself? Or was he talking about somebody else? And if he was talking about somebody else, who exactly was he talking about? Well, one day, after Jesus had come, after Jesus had died and rose again and ascended to God the Father, a man named Philip met another man who just happened to be reading from that same passage in the book of Isaiah. And that man who was reading Isaiah asked Philip this question. He asked him, of whom is the prophet speaking? Is he speaking of himself or is he speaking of some other man? And at that question, the book of Acts chapter 8 tells us that Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture in Isaiah chapter 53 and told that man about Jesus. Philip told that man how that Isaiah's passage talks about the sorrow of Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Philip told that man that Isaiah's passage spoke about the suffering of Jesus. He was oppressed 
and he was afflicted. He was brought like a lamb to the slaughter. He was cut off out of the land of the living. And Philip told that man how that Isaiah's passage talks about the substitution of Jesus' death. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. Indeed, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of all of us. Isaiah says this, For the transgression of my people, He was stricken. And then Philip told that man how that Isaiah's passage revealed the satisfaction of Jesus' sacrifice of himself. The satisfaction that Jesus' sacrifice of himself wrought. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And that is not to suggest that God the Father found joy in the suffering of God the Son. But it does suggest that it was God's will to bring it upon him. He, God the Father, it says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul. God the Father shall see the travail of the suffering and the death of the Son of God, and God the Father shall be satisfied. The righteousness of God is satisfied. The holiness of God is satisfied. The demand of God, the judgment of God, the wrath of God are all satisfied in the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God. <coughs> in Jesus Christ, God is satisfied. Among that section of the Tanakh, that is the Ketuvim, the writings, is the book of Psalms. And though Jesus is in all of the other books that make up the writings, in Psalm chapter 24, we find Jesus in the writings. Jesus in the Ketuvim. Psalm 24 begins with a grand statement. It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein. It says that the earth belongs to God, and so does everything that is in the earth belong to God. It all belongs to the Lord. And then Psalm 24 speaks of a king. It speaks of a king of glory who will return to his people. And then Psalm 24 asks this question twice. In Psalm 24, 8 and Psalm 24, 10, it asks this question, Who is this king of glory? Who is this king of glory? who has right to the earth and everything that is in it? Who is this king whom we receive and who receives us? Who is this king who shall return to his people? Who is this king of glory? Well, Matthew 
chapter 25 and verse 31 says this. When Jesus shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, Jesus is referred to as the Lord of glory. And in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16, it tells us that when Jesus returns, he will have on his vesture and on his thigh a name written that you will recognize it is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 makes the glorious announcement that one day, one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever and ever. The 24th Psalm Psalm 24 asks, Who is this King of glory? I have absolutely no doubt in my mind. I believe with all of my heart, with all of my soul, that the answer to that question is Jesus. Jesus is the King of glory. And so, Jesus boldly challenged his opponents, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures, and in every one of them, Jesus says, you will find me. Examine the Tanakh, and in every part of it, you will find me. Jesus is found in the Torah. Jesus is found in the prophets. Jesus is found in the writings. They all talk about Jesus, a coming Messiah, a dying Savior, a risen and coming King. Who is this king of glory? His name is Jesus Christ. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
God be with you.